we're going live at this point. Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this week's webinar, Palliative Care and COVID-19 Clinical and Prevention Aspects. This webinar is being recorded and will be available shortly after completion. My name is Dr. Stephen Connor. I'm the Executive Director of the Worldwide Hospice Palliative Care Alliance, and I'm moderating the session today. This webinar is number three in a series of nine in a project um, on palliative care and COVID-19 developed in partnership jointly by the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care, uh, the International Children's Palliative Care Network, the uh, Palliative Care and Humanitarian Aid Situations and Emergencies Group, and the Worldwide Hospice Palliative Care Alliance. The objective of this series is to provide globally relevant information and guidance to civil society and UN organizations, policymakers, administrators, healthcare providers uh, on palliative care in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. The webinars are accompanied by briefing notes that are written by experts from around the world. These briefing notes are available on a website, globalpalliativecare.org. Uh, and the webinars, these webinars are actually uploaded to the WHPCA website for, um, for viewing later. We're very grateful to the contributors of this series and to today's presenters for accepting our invitation to participate in this collaborative project. Today's webinar will feature three 15-minute presentations with time at the end for questions and answers. We will also have reflection from Harmala Gupta from Can Support in India, who will share some reflections as a cancer survivor. You can submit your questions, please do, um, through the chat box. And one of the WHPCA team, um, Kate uh, Jackson, will uh, be condensing and reading them to the speakers after the presentations. Our first speaker today is Professor Lucas Radbrack, Chair of Palliative Medicine at University of Bonn in Germany and Chairperson of the IAHPC. He will be speaking on symptom control for patients with COVID-19. Over to you, Lucas. Yeah, thank you. Will you put up the presentation then? Yes, I will. Thank you very much. So um, I'm honored to talk about symptom control for COVID-19. And I'm very grateful to uh, Dr. Ali and Dr. Chan, who contributed valuably to the briefing note that we developed for the initiative. And um, yeah, I think you can go on. Um, basically what we did is um, we compiled information from our German guidelines that we had done on symptom control um, but also taking into account other guidelines and um, clinical practice information from other parts of the world. Uh, could you go on one to the next one? Um, so what symptoms do we have to deal with? Um, there has been a recent, um, well, editorial on COVID-19 and symptom burden, um, giving some information on breathlessness and cough as the predominant symptoms but there's also been a wealth of recording that anxiety, delirium, diarrhea, or other gastrointestinal symptoms, or even more exotic symptoms are not that uncommon in these patients. We had a bit of a discussion initially um, what, what kind of symptoms we would deal with. And I think for the, from the palliative care perspective, uh, we are looking at the symptoms that we can alleviate with our medic uh, pharmacological, non-pharmacological uh, symptom control, but rather not as at neurological problems, um, such as stroke-like symptoms, anosmia, um, lack of smelling, lack of tasting, or um, more reported frequently and then recently, uh, renal insufficiency and cardiac problems or um, problems with coagulation. Uh, and we do not talk about long-term sequelae for survivors of COVID. So the main, I think the main and most burdensome symptom definitely is breathlessness. Can you go on one, please? Um, for that, um, we took care that we describe um, interventions that also work in resource poor settings. So as a comparator, I've brought up the ESMO recommendations, which have been published recently, I think a week ago, uh, which favor transdermal application or parenteral application of opioids. And in contrast to that, um, we thought that it's more important that you have some uh, universally available um, and, um, and some, uh, something that can be taken orally and that is as cheap as possible. So can you go on please one more? 
And that basically means that we would recommend um, opioids, but we would recommend oral morphine as the, the, the standard procedure for breathlessness, at least in patients who do not have any opioid pretreatment. Um, the dosages are fairly low, so um, two and a half to five milligrams four hourly would be recommended, resulting in daily dosages of 20 to 30 milligrams, um, sometimes even lower than that. Uh, you may need uh, an antiemetic, at least in the initial period. Uh, we would recommend haloperidol for that, and you definitely would have to prescribe a rescue medication in addition to that, such as um, morphine, two and a half to five milligrams, so the four hourly dose as usual, would do well. Um, there is a number of non-pharmacological issues that, could do, that you could use as well, like body positioning with the upper body elevated. Um, relaxation techniques may be helpful. A cool towel on the face. Um, for, for this and all other symptoms, uh, we had a lot of discussions, at least in our German groups, um, that you should avoid anything that raises the aerosol level in the air. So. Uh, handheld fans, for example, are not recommended. Uh, we would do that in cancer patients, but not in COVID patients, because it was, would increase the, dis, uh, the dissemination of the aerosols. Um, in contrast to other patients where we are always a bit shy of oxygen, in these patients, you would start early with oxygen, and you would even use high flow oxygen if it is available with an oxygen reservoir. Next, please. Uh, if patients are already pretreated with opioids, then you would increase the dosage by 20%, um, and you would increase the rescue medication as well, so that it ends up with one sixth of the daily dosage. So in the example we are giving from 30 milligrams, uh, you would increase to 40 milligrams, um, which would be a bit more than the 20% uh, increase, but you would try to stay in that uh, level of um, getting uh, dose increases. You could always use alternative opioids if available. Um, you should only use alternative opioids if you have um, rapid acting formulation available. Next, please. For patients who do not, who are not able to intake oral opioids, um, you, you obviously have to start parenterally, so either intravenously or subcutaneously. And again, as you can see, the dosages are pretty low. So for pain patients, you usually would use much higher dosages. Here you end up with five to 10 milligrams per day or one to two milligrams per four hourly bolus. And again, you probably would use the same amount as a rescue um, dose for what that you would use as a four hourly dose. Syringe drivers are preferred, but if not available, then bolus injections every four hours are fine. You could think about transdermal opioids, but in these patients with the very low dosages and the um, changing requirements, you probably find that they are too sluggish in their reaction because any dose adjustment would only be felt a day afterwards. Next, please. Um, so we already had that with the non-pharmacological approaches, um, and I don't have to elaborate on that. I think that should be, with, with all patients, you should think about the non-pharmacological approaches. Next, please. Um, I'm hurrying through this because I'm conscious of the time. So for cuff, um, again, you would need the opioids, um, or you could use specific medications like noscapine. But um, actually, I would prefer morphine, um, again, low dose, subcutaneously or orally, whatever the patient can take. Um, there, with productive cuff, anti-cuff medications should not be given during, during daytime. I think that's something we all know from cancer patients. And again, in addition to the pharmacological solutions, you would think about also or about non-pharmacological interventions like increasing ambient humidity, increasing oral fluid intake, um, having some some home remedies like ginger and honey, thyme cuff solution, sour candy, saline gargle, whatever, or again, upper body positioning um, upright when sleeping so that um, any, um, any secretions would run down instead of being in the throat and um, producing cuff. Next, please. Um, anxiety, any benzodiazepine will do. In our recommendations, we would talk about lorazepam or midazolam, 
actually diazepam is the one that's recommended in the essential medicine list, so you could use that one also. I think the main advantage of lorazepam would be um, that you can really, um, it, it's, it's got a very short duration of action, so you can um, steer the dosage and adapt the dosage much easier than with the longer acting benzodiazepines. And midazolam obviously has an advantage, especially in severe anxiety, where you might want really to sedate the patient. Um, and then that, again, has the um, advantage of the very short duration of action. Next, please. Agitation delirium is pretty frequent, at least with patients who have severe COVID-19. And um, you probably would want to target your symptom intervention a bit in relation to whether it's the um, anxiety, uh, restlessness side that is more prominent, or the um, psychotic side with hallucinations, confusions. So in one case, again, it would be benzos, and the other, it would be neuroleptics such as haloperidol. And I think the dosages are the ones we are all familiar with from our usual palliative care practice. Next. Um, as usual with ag agitation delirium, you would want to think about any causal factors that you can remedy. Um, I, I think we, are, we all know about the, the, the odd patient who is, seems to be fully psychotic, but when you um, find that the bladder is full and you put in a catheter, then uh, the situation improves markedly. So full bladder, full bowel, um, relieving fever, um, any intervention where you can remedy a causal factor certainly will help with the agitation. Uh, the usual rules for communication with the patient, so don't ask complicated questions, um, simple questions, reaffirming, um, producing a quiet environment with a well-lit and quiet room, um, orientation for the patient, like placing a picture at the side of the bed or um, keeping informing him where he is, uh, what's happening, what's the actual situation might be very helpful. Next, please. For all symptom control measures, as I said, one of the, the, the basic rules will be that manipulations in the nasopharyngeal cavity should be avoided if possible. So for example, initially in Germany, we thought about intranasal midazolam or intranasal opioids, and we decided against recommending that because it would be a manipulation in that area would increase the aerosol dissemination. With uncontrolled cuffing or secretions, again, you would avoid any oral transmucosal or intranasal application, as with that, it, it could lead to more aerosol being produced or being disseminated. Um, parenteral application routes may be necessary if oral is not possible. Um, and I realize that at least in resource poor settings, parenteral application may be impossible as well. So then um, alternatives for oral might be, you, you have to use some imagination, some invention. Um, infusion pumps are preferred, but if not, bolus injections can be used as an alternative. And again, as we know from other patients, if you use sub-Q injections, then you can put in a needle and that can be left in place for several days. So, so you can avoid repeated injections for that patient. So um, I haven't looked at the watch, but I think um, we're, we're good in time. So um, that's the end of the presentation and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, no, actually we're gonna hold the questions. So I'm sorry, Lucas, to the end. Right. Yeah, right. fine with that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I just wanna mention that all of the um, briefing notes um, are available at the website at the bottom of the page. Uh, and, um, so there, where I think have, we think we have 20, 21. Some of those uh, are not yet completed, uh, but as soon as they're uh, they're finished, they'll be posted on the website. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lucas. Uh, excellent guidance for our clinicians out there. I think we probably will have lots of questions at the end uh, for you. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Carla Alexander, who is clinical assistant professor and director of palliative care for the Institute for Human Virology at the University of Maryland. She'll be speaking on precautions for healthcare providers and caregivers, infection control protocols. Thanks very much. And over to you, Carla. Unmute yourself, Carla. Sorry. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Hope everyone is well. Um,
I was asked to speak about uh, personal protective equipment because earlier in the um, pandemic, this was a crisis issue. Um, and uh, I think that it remains a crisis issue and I want everyone to understand it remains a crisis issue in every country and particularly for hospice programs. Uh, it's not uh, even in the US, even in cities, um, these materials are not always available. So we all have to do the best we can. Uh, Stephen, are you gonna? You can. So I'm just gonna run through a little bit about um, how can we really approach taking care of ourselves and protecting ourselves. Next slide. And I forgot to say happy May Day. Today is Workers' Day. It's important. <laughs> you know, we all have to remain united. And next slide shows uh, what people used to be able to do on uh, May Day. And I was trying to figure out how you could do that and keep people six feet apart. It would be beautiful. <laughs> next slide. Um, and this is just a reminder that for each country, each uh, state, wherever you are, uh, this curve is moving on and um, things develop on a daily basis. And uh, I think the most important thing I wanted to remind you to do is not to take your information from Facebook or from uh, social media, but to try to look for scholarly articles that really give you uh, well-founded information. Okay, next. And, and I was thinking that what calms me down in the middle of a crisis, trying to figure out how to protect myself and the people around me is thinking about Dame Sicily, just saying, just be still, just be there. Next slide, please. And this has made an, an incredible difference in our hospital uh, to remind people that when HIV first started, we were in exactly the same place in terms of fears about contagion. Next slide. Next slide. And can you go back to the other slide? Yeah. And the other thing that's important for me is it's the um, I don't even know what year anniversary of my father's death and um, also the 100 days in Rwanda. Uh, I say those things because, again, what's really important in a pandemic is to have context to understand your history and figure out where am I actually and what can I do next year. That's my team. Next slide. <laughs> So, um, so we appreciate um, Richard Powell's article on key attributes of palliative care and pandemics, relief of suffering, supporting com complex decision-making and managing clinical uncertainty. But I think you have to hit the next slide, Stephen. Uh, but relief, sorry, go back. Relief of suffering can be relieved in small but powerful ways, as you all know, but just to remind ourselves on a daily basis, a kind word, a tone of voice, a pen of listening are things that are important. Next. Um, I put this in here so that when you get the slides, you would be able to look at it and read it. I thought it was interesting from a a uh, doctor in um, Washington, in the Washington Post. She's a palliative care physician, uh, and she just did a very nice summary of palliative care for the public. Next slide. The other thing that's important in terms of protecting yourself is to think about um, how can I categorize what's going on? How can I get a big, better hold on all these patients because they're coming and going and they all have really different problems. Some that we're caring for are people who don't know whether they're positive or not. Next, they're sick, they might be symptomatic. Uh, 
as Lucas was just talking about. Uh, the, the, uh, what we're seeing in the intensive care patients is that they die very suddenly, unexpectedly. That means that the family may or may not have had time to be notified. So this is becoming a traumatic death. And we've been trying to address how to support the family, uh, at least to say goodbye to the patient with a tablet or a phone or some way of communicating. And then um, all the other people we have to take care of, as well as ourselves. Next. So I love this slide. It's um, what we have in palliative care, right? Is perspective. Can you see it? Four. He's four and three. You know, but but that's what we have to do all the time, and that is our it's our skill set, our talent, and what we bring to every conversation. So sometimes when people are frantic about whether or not they have uh, personal protective equipment, I'm like, the first thing we need to do is to relax a little bit and see how else can we manage this problem without having to have that mask right here, right this minute. Next slide. So I think that the, it's really um, turning out, at least in the US, because our curve has flattened, we're, what we're facing is a constant number of people with active disease um, over an undefined length of time. We don't have staff, staffing for that. So the emotional burden of the disease is on us, the, the healthcare providers. Next slide. Um, again, I try to go back to the culture and, and literature to think about, you know, where are we? Why, why is this so important? And why is it so, such a problem? Because obviously we haven't paid attention to losses in any of our cultures very well. Um, and uh, so what happens, at least in the city where I work, is that people have been previously traumatized in their early life from losses or um, throughout their life from multiple significant losses. And they develop a PTSD-like reaction. So that adds to the anxiety that's sort of been floating from COVID. And you get, uh, and, so, and so the anxiety of the health workers is, um, the same as the families, and it's interacting sometimes in a non-positive way because when you have that level of anxiety, your facial expressions are not normal. And the things that you normally use to calm people like your voice and your body habitus don't work. It's... Next. If you haven't seen this whiteboard psychology, look it up. It's kind of fun to go on there and look at uh, what people are posting. These are all health workers who are talking about how they feel about COVID. Next slide. Next slide. And I, and I put this one, I wanted you all to have that. Can you go back? I don't know if you all have this slide, so I put it in the slide set because I think it's really important to use with patients and families how, how we want grief to work and how grief actually works. Next slide. That's important because we're t dealing with multiple loss syndrome here. Next perspective, keep going. So protecting ourselves and others. Go ahead, next slide. This is one option, okay, next slide. Uh, hand hygiene that we that the WHO has given great uh, guidance about, but you still have to be creative because people don't always have even soap and water. Um, so rubbing your hands together uh, to be able to cleanse them after you've been dealing uh, or touching something that could have virus on it, it is more helpful. Um, and, but just try to avoid putting it in your eyes. Uh, next slide. Oops, sorry. And this was another one, a very creative sponge. I don't know how she does this, but you know, whatever. Next slide. Um, 
The distancing is so incredibly important, physical distancing. I don't like the term social distancing. <laughs> um, the most important thing I think I really want to emphasize is this part about the hard surfaces. Next slide. Oh, and isolation, social isolation, because people are really having difficulty at this time being separated into their own homes and not able to congregate. It's quite difficult for everyone. Next slide. I'm getting some background noise if the faculty can mute their mics if they're not speaking. Thanks. Probably. It's because somebody, you? it's a truck backing up oh, outside okay. of the building. Sorry. Yeah. Carry on. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm in a construction zone. Uh, so, so this is, to me, really important, this slide about where does the coronavirus live. Um, so when people are coughing and sneezing, the droplets can go for really six feet or more. Um, and so it's really important to take uh, protective efforts for yourself just to get away from that person who's coughing or sneezing. But think about the hard surfaces, glass, countertops, plastic, stainless steel. That, those are the places where the virus will sit for or up to 72 hours. So when you are touching, walking down the tube station and you put your hand on the side, those are hard surfaces that may have more virus. That's why you see people wearing gloves. And, uh, but that's really the whole um, reason why it's so important to wash your hands. When it's on cardboard, paper, or fabric, their porous surfaces it goes away pretty quickly. Um, I did um, highlight, can you hit the next slide? I mean the next button. See, uh, there's a chat there and I can't go. Porous surfaces uh, are much less likely to be liable yeah. on the virus. Right, so, so that you shouldn't have to worry as much about your clothing, in fact. Uh, clearly, if you wash things after you've worn them in a high, an area where you have a high exposure, but uh, it's, you shouldn't find the virus living there for a long time. Next slide. I put this in uh, one of our physicians. Uh, this is sort of, he just wrote down what it is he does when he goes home. Uh, he tries to have one set of clothing and one pair of shoes. Now, lots of people only have one pair of shoes, but the point would be leave them outside your house when you come home from work and just know that it's better. You can clean them with uh, soap and water or a sanitizing wipe, anything that you can clean them off with, but uh, don't track them in your house. Um, we advise people not to use metal jewelry, wrist, wristwatches, earrings, nose rings, if possible, and to put your hair back. Um, what we do in our hospital is that people come in and um, they bring, they come in in a, clothing that they're going to work in, but then they take that clothing off before they leave and put it in a bag, and then that can be laundered. Um, and if you can't launder it at 80 degrees, which is 26 uh, centigrade, you, or put it in a hot dryer, then um, you can just leave it in a closed paper bag for several days, and it will um, be okay. Next slide. I didn't know how he did this. <laughs> but this is just what? another. <laughs> it's an, it looks like an onion, right? Next. Yeah. Next. Oops. Yeah. So the the I'm sure you've all read the the um, wonderful systematic review that came out right for the pandemic uh, from the UK, but um, I choose to focus on the ones that say facilitating camaraderie among staff and adopt measures to deal with stress. Using technology to communicate with patient, uh, patients and carers. That's 
stressful again for care providers. It's not the way we're accustomed to communicating with people, but uh, it's possible. We've been working really hard over the last few weeks to understand how can you be more yourself when you're actually on uh, a Zoom call and not not um, be distant from the patient, that you're, the family that you're talking to. Next slide. Um, so the context is this is not business as usual. This is a crisis. That means that the rules change. That means things that we've put in place sometimes for multiple different reasons may get in the way of taking care of people. So always step back when you're having a struggle and think what else is going on here? Why, why is this happening? Because it's really because everyone's under pressure. Um, next slide. And solve problems together, yeah. I like this lady. She got her dog all dressed up. Next slide. Just wanted to remind you, wait, you didn't see the man with his thumb. Yeah. See his thumb? Good news. <laughs> I just want to remind you to take care of yourself. Next slide. Um, and to think about uh, ways to keep your own mind calm and peaceful. Uh, I had a conversation with the residents about this yesterday. When you become very anxious, uh, it won't help solve problems. So try to do some meditation, do the things that you do, and be at peace when you're working with patients and families. Look around you, see nature. Next slide. Um, and then those are some suggestions for podcasts uh, on happiness and one on well-being. And there are also in the US helplines for people who have substance abuse problems for whom this is a great uh, added stress and possible trigger. Next slide. Um, so COVID-19, our lives will never be the same again. We can choose to walk into this together. We will learn from this experience and share with others. This is not the last virus we will face, nor the last personal challenge. There are logical steps to take if you sit down and think it through. What each of us does with this information is for us to reflect upon at the end of today and each day, because it's that reflection and that calm time that helps us do the work that we do. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. Thank you very much, Carla. Really appreciate it. Uh, we, we also will be doing some uh, further work on stress management in future webinars. Okay. Um, I think this is still your presentation here, yeah, right? Okay, so we're going to move on now to the next presentation. Thanks, Carla, again. Uh, Dr. Dingle Spence is the Senior Medical Officer of the Hope uh, Institute Hospital in Kingston, Jamaica. And she's also a member of the um, IAHPC board. She'll be speaking today on palliative care for the patient with cancer in low and middle income countries during the COVID-19. Over to you, Dinkle. Thank you. So thank you for inviting me to be on this really excellent series. Um, and I am hoping Stephen's gonna put my slides up. So I'm speaking to you from the early sunny morning in Jamaica, which is as Carla said, I'm very grateful for to be able to live in a warm country with uh, sunshine pretty much every day. Um, so this is based on a briefing note that, and I'll acknowledge at the end of the presentation, um, with Dr. Jim Cleary and Dr. Uh, I can't pronounce your name, Dr. K-N-A-N-H from Vietnam. Somebody can um, advise me how best to pronounce that. So the three of us uh, came together and um, put the briefing note together and then I've done some more specific uh, work on talking about cancer patients. So next slide, please. So obviously uh, we don't need to remind ourselves but we're here to um, relieve and prevent suffering. And 
the urgent relief of physical symptoms is, is even more pressing um, than it has been in usually for palliative care um, practitioners and obviously the psychological and spiritual support, compassionate care. And all of this is kind of in, in, a, in a sort of um, exploding bottle, it feels like. Um, and there's a quote from, I think it's Richard Horton from The Lancet, who says, a pandemic is a cause and a powerful amplifier of suffering. And I think that's absolutely the case. And it requires an even more acute response than we usually provide, because palliative care is often um, an acute specialty, particularly when you're, you're looking after people with advanced cancer. And so the acute response that we normally um, step forward with, I'm, I'm finding that certainly in my practice, it, we have to really, we can't sit around and, and watch people and say, you'll come back next week. We have to look after you today. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little background and this nobody really needs reminding, but most of us who live in LMICs, palliative care is really not well integrated into our health systems. And what we're dealing with is, low side of isolated provision and sometimes that's run by NGOs or it may be run by the state. So in Jamaica, just to say, we have hospital-based palliative care and very little, if any, community-based palliative care. So one of the problems we have is that people have to travel distances to access uh, palliative care. And then of course, providing care for cancer patients, whether it's palliative care or even oncology care in LMICs can also be difficult even in the normal circumstances. So the sorts of things that we face, uh, and these are pre-existing and pre-pandemic issues, um, so high percentage of patients presenting with advanced disease, um, there's often very unclear pathways of how to refer to palliative care that may exist. And then if you are able to access palliative care, there may be well, um, there may be limited capacity uh, to provide services. And then the other thing is general oncology care is, is the clear pathways may be not obvious and therefore urgent care that really kind of lays bare how difficult it may be to get people to access care. And then there may be oncology provision. Sorry, can you? Thank you. Um, but there, there may not be good um, communication between the central services and the community palliative care providers if you're in a situation where palliative care is more uh, community based in your country. Um, and the central oncology providers may not communicate well with you as to how um, their patients are doing. Uh, so that can also be another issue. And then the distances that people have to travel um, before. And now, of course, it's much more difficult because certainly here we have curfews and lockdowns. And so it's very challenging for people to be able to come out. Uh, taxi men do not want to carry um, anybody who looks unwell in our country. And they certainly don't want to carry people in uniform who are in you know look like they work for the health sector because everybody's pretty terrified uh, next slide please so as i said we it's really an urgent response um, that we need to be providing for our cancer patients and obviously oncology care uh, must continue we cannot unfortunately press the pause button and hope that everybody will just be okay until it all goes away so we are constantly responding to the severe distress of, of and often the acute complications of cancer. So obviously what we would recommend is that people with far advanced disease should really be managed at home. And it, there may be existing infrastructure that we can mobilize. One of the things I find myself doing over the last couple of weeks is literally giving a palliative care tutorial over the phone to people in health centers or private practice family doctors who may be more rural um, and just really talking to them about an approach about decent symptom control and pro providing support like that and what that really does is highlight the fact of how important it is when all of this passes over and we're in the less acute setting how important it is to follow this through and to provide education for people out there um, in the primary primary care setting. So one of the things we've had to do, um, and I'm sure most folks having to do, is set priorities. So who are the most urgent patients? What are the most urgent needs? 
do we need to manage um, what's going on with you with a short hospital admission? Do we need to bring your clinic appointment forward? And so what we've ended up doing is that we've been calling most of our patients and finding out whether they really need to be seen. If they need a prescription, we will just write the prescription and get that to the pharmacy or one of their caregivers will come and pick it up. Um, and so what's happening is that our clinics are now full with really sick people because the less well, um, medium or lower priority folk we have asked to stay at home. And then of course it becomes much more complex if the patient is COVID positive. We are quite lucky in Jamaica. We only have about 420 cases in our 2.8 million population. And so far, none of them appear to be a cancer patient. So I can't say I have experience of looking after cancer patients with COVID at the moment. I'm sure it will come. Next slide, please. So the sort of things that were high priority um, that we usually really need to bring you in on urgent basis to the clinic or possibly for a short hospital admission. Um, so obviously severe uncontrolled pain that's not being managed at home, spinal cord compression, pathological fractures, SVCO is, is unfortunately fairly common in our population. Um, and Lucas spoke eloquently about how to manage dyspnea and that would be dyspnea from underlying cancer and then you add COVID on top of it. Um, that's obviously a, 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 um, an urgent issue. One of the things we see a lot of in our population because of the advanced cancers is a lot of bleeding. So hemoptysis, um, rectal and vaginal bleeding from advanced cancers and hemorrhage from advanced wounds, particularly breast cancer. We have a lot of women with very advanced breast cancer and acute hemorrhage. And again, we can't just leave them at home. They need urgent treatment. Um, effusions, um, plural, we see quite often and a lot of ascites. So as soon as we pick you up in the clinic, can we tap tap you that day and help you to get back home? and so on. Um, brain mets, DVT, and let us not forget the severe emotional distress that may, with suicidal ideation perhaps, that may need actual um, admission to help us manage that. Next slide, please. So again, we're here, the, the short admission, great. Hopefully we can sort out your symptoms, but then we need to get you back home. Um, which is always a preferred place. And in particular, now it's a preferred place because relatives can't travel, uh, restricted visiting in hospitals and so on. So once we get you back home, we need to ensure the continued supply of your medication. And in Jamaica, and I think like many uh, folks in LMICs, our prescription duration is only two weeks. Some countries it's only a week. And that's obviously crazy in the best of times, but particularly now when we're trying to limit um, people moving around. So we have, uh, we're recommending that application be made to your competent authority or relevant um, government personnel to at least do an emergency extension uh, for one month's duration. Um, you, could you just show me the next slide and then we'll go back to this one, Stephen. This is just a reminder, and I think Dr. Sami Ahmed showed this last week, um, that the INCB is supporting us, and, and this is a document that you can use along with an accompanying letter to write to your government or competent authority to say, look, we have international support to uh, help us improve access to medicines during this pandemic. People may not want to make the extension to prescriptions long term, but it should absolutely happen at least for three months and then maybe reviewed um, to see whether we need to continue with that and that we could go back to the last slide. Um, and I think this is one of the most important things that we could do to help our patients. The other thing is, is that certainly in Jamaica, people will tend to travel into cities to access their medicines and they may not be aware of what's available where they live. And so one of the things we're trying to do is to ensure that there are either government pharmacies that are stocking opioids or sometimes people may have to access private pharmacies that may also stop opioids, but to help people know, well, actually you don't need to travel all this distance because there's somewhere nearer to you where you can access these things. Uh, moving on to people who may need radiotherapy, which is a large part of, of advanced cancer palliation. I know that there's many LMICs who don't even have radiotherapy services. 
Um, but if you do, what we're suggesting is very short fractionation. So can we um, just give an eight gray single fraction? So for the radiotherapists out there, this language will mean something to you. Just a single treatment to painful bone mets. Um, sometimes we can use an eight gray or 10 gray single fraction to palliate hemoptysis. Um, we classically use um, a, a three-day fractionation for, for bleeding for our hemostatic doses. And then um, we use what's called the quad shot technique, which is using uh, two treatments twice a day um, and then repeating that a month later. And you get excellent rapid palliation, particularly in head and neck cancers where people may have fungating wounds. Um, again, very common. This is an excellent technique. Even if you only get in one um, four treatment session, it's um, surprisingly effective and very uh, few side effects. And then if it's possible to bring the person back the following month to, to do it again, then that's what we would recommend. Obviously, we're doing a lot more um, speaking over the phone. And it's really important um, to, to keep people updated with what's going on with their family. Usually, you know, we try and have in-person family meetings, but just because we can't do that doesn't mean that the communication should fall away. Really critical at this time to keep people informed. And also, of course, we need to be talking about goals of care. You know, do you really need to come in? Um, and then there's a whole other discussion that we that could take another several hours about oncology patients who are requiring radical treatment. But I'm really speaking now about palliative care patients. So goals of care treatment uh, conversations are really critical. And, you know, are, is the person going to pass away to die in an institution or can we do whatever we can to, to get them home after their short admission where hopefully they have been made more comfortable? Next slide. Um, right, and then again, you know, this is what we do in palliative care anyway, employ all re existing resources, but the, it's that pressure cooker feeling that we need to get everybody in um, and, and uh, attend to the patient's needs as, as kind of intensely as it is possible can we call on the faith-based community that people come from in Jamaica where it's a very Christian country and a lot of people depend on their churches for support. And it may be that um, we can send people home with um, telephone support from their church community. Um, it's often a very useful avenue to explore. And then of course, if people are speaking, uh, are looking after a, a cancer patient who is has COVID, we need to be able to teach them about how to manage that. That's going to be obviously very difficult, particularly in crowded uh, family homes. And, you know, we lack PPE in the professional situation, much less what it's like in the community. But I have to say people in Jamaica have been extremely resourceful. There's hundreds now of beautifully colored cloth masks out there and all sorts of inventive ways of, of keeping um, oneself clean and your environment clean. And the other thing that um, I think it's worth considering if you don't already have it, is can we set up an urgent care support number from central office as it were, because a lot more support is going to be required over the telephone or video linkage. And it might not be something you have in place, but can we put that in kind of now? Um, and even if it's not 24 hours, can we make it an 18 hour service and that folks uh, have the number to call in? And then as Carla um, really well, lovely uh, uh, talk, Carla, about supporting ourselves, staff support, formal and informal support, and obviously training on how to use PPE. We don't suddenly want to think, oh my God, how do I do donning and doffing um, because they're calling me to a bleeding uh, cancer patient who's also COVID positive. So we need to be prepared. We know how to manage these things um, before they come upon us. And obviously we need to be aware of our institutional infection control procedures and make sure that those are followed. Next slide. So in conclusion, um, certainly what I'm seeing and feeling is that we know we have vast inadequacies in palliative care and symptom relief. And what this crisis is doing is laying that bare and making it even clearer how 
poor really the situation is to support people particularly in the community and of course our cancer patients are in a double facing a double whammy of needing acute symptom relief which may necessitate traveling they're already in immunocompromised by definition of having cancer that tends to make you immunocompromised um, and so very careful decision making about bringing people out of their homes to somewhere to help improve their symptoms needs to be considered very very carefully and then of course what this leaves us with is this need to put in longer term strategies that we've been talking about for a long time the world health assembly from 2014 has been asking us to do this and i think that after um, we may have greater leverage with our governments about um, improving access to essential medicines and to having good palliative care education out there and just to end with a, a quote from a very recent article by Lucas Radrick and Felicia Noll et al that we need to develop uh, long-term preparedness strategies that embed palliative care into the core of medicine I thought that was a wonderful statement thank you and last slide just to acknowledge Jim and Dr Na from Vietnam who helped me put this briefing note together thank you Lovely. Thank you very much, Kingle. Um, we're going to, I, I think it's, it really does point up the uh, critical importance of, of maintaining palliative care for our patients um, during uh, this period, because we're, we, you know, we've been hearing stories of uh, cancer patients being uh, essentially thrown out of hospitals uh, <clears throat> to make room for COVID patients. And, um, there's there's some real significant issues I think of, of uh, ethics and justice and uh, and just the practical practicalities of um, ensuring people get palliative care. So thank you very much, Dingle. Uh, we're going to move on to have some commentary. Uh, I'll just mention that um, our global palliative care organizations really believe strongly in um, involvement of people with palliative care needs and people with lived experience of uh, the illnesses that we care for. Uh, to be involved in the planning and implementation and presentation of uh, education policy, et cetera. So you, we're, you'll, you'll be seeing this, I think, if you stay with us for future webinars, that we're always going to have some commentary from uh, affected um, people. And today we're um, lucky to have uh, Harmala Gupta with us from, from India, who we've asked just to give us some reflection on today's uh, presentations and, and whatever else. I think strikes you, Harmala, is important to convey. Please, over to you. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, everyone, for your presentations. I think Dr. Dingle Spence covered a lot of the issues that face us here in India as well. All I can say, it looks like there's a new emperor of maladies in town. Uh, it's not cancer anymore. It's COVID-19, and everything seems to be geared towards fighting COVID-19. And I think people with other illnesses and conditions are kind of feeling left out. They, they, you know, the hospitals that they used to go to I tell them not to come anymore. Many of the hospital, the units have been turned into units for fighting COVID-19. And uh, people go there and they find that their OPDs are now closed uh, when it comes to cancer treatments or um, other conditions that they need to come for. There is, of course, the lockdown, which makes it impossible almost for you to travel on public transport. And those uh, who we look after are really people who come from underserved communities who do not have what it takes to afford private uh, transport. Neither are they conversant with uh, telemedicine. They don't have the means by which they can speak to their doctors on videos and make appointments, etc., or get advice. Uh, there is also the other issue of loss of livelihoods that has happened as a consequence of this lockdown. And many of our patients now don't only need medications, but they also need food rations to keep surviving. So as someone said, you know, uh, I'm not so worried about dying of COVID-19, but I'm more worried about dying of starvation. And there's a tremendous, there's a tremendous level of anxiety on uh, patients uh, because a few of them have uh, uh, the feeling that perhaps if there was an emergency 
and they had to go to a hospital and they were diagnosed with COVID-19, uh, would they be considered kind of expendable because there are considered patients with advanced cancers? Uh, would they be considered a priority or not when it came, came to saving their lives or treating them? So I think that is an extra worry. There's a worry on the families too, who uh, now are not quite sure how to care for and look after the patient in the best way. Many of them have to make forays outdoors um, now and then. And uh, they're living in conditions where they're very much cheap by jowl. Uh, so th these are, and, and then the other thing I think that we must keep in mind is that COVID-19, people who get it, are almost being stigmatized today, sadly. Even if you're in quarantine, people don't want to come anywhere near you. And, you know, it's like, I want to know who's in quarantine in my area so I can give them a wide berth. So, so people with cancer anyway fighting advanced disease have, are now facing a kind of a double stigma if they get COVID-19. And, and that's extremely worrying. I think the other thing is the media, the messaging out there, it's been so contradictory. And it has, and it has been from the top. Even author, so-called authoritative sources have said uh, at one point, you don't need masks. No, 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 you must wear masks. You don't need to wear gloves. Gloves can, in fact, uh, lead to more infection. Just keep washing your hands, et cetera, et cetera. So people are confused. And, and they really don't know what it is that they need to do, which is why I think at Can Support, our telephone helpline has worked very well because we've had encouraged people to phone us in and so that we can give them the information. Our home care teams, and I think never more has a home care program for palliative care become more needed and important than now. Our, our teams are trying to go, are going to homes, of course, wearing personal protective equipment. Uh, leaving medication for uh, patients who need it. Um, many of our patients went back to their villages and were stranded there. And I'm afraid the Indian medical system is such that there's no access to any kind of care uh, available uh, at the district level uh, for people who have, um, who need palliative care. And they often have to travel to cities, which has become almost impossible. So uh, we have been talking to local authorities. Our doctors have kind of taken the initiative to, to ask the people there, who is your local authority? Let me speak to that person and telling that person, here's my patient. He needs this medication. He needs these food rations. Can you please arrange them? So this, this, these, these kinds of um, initiatives are emerging now. Uh, we've had patients who needed uh, an ascites staff or they've had some kind of a blockage in the intestine, they needed an intervention. So our, uh, um, our doctors have tried to uh, help them um, in their homes to assist that. Um, it, and so it is really a worrying time. Uh, everyone's feeling their way. Uh, and I think that's, that's the impression that most people have, uh, that there are really no clear signposts. We're all learning on the job as it were. But I think that human touch is so important. And I think that's what our team is really doing to let people know they're not alone, that even though they may be in a lockdown, they are cared for, that we're available for them uh, whenever they need us. And I think that has to some extent set aside the uh, uh, anxieties, but uh, we know that people with mental health issues are really facing a tough time now. Uh, you know, with this enforced isolation um, and um, we are conscious of the fact that even our um, caregivers themselves and the caretakers also often need uh, counseling um, and we have set up, we are thinking of setting up a dedicated um, helpline for first responders as well uh, to be able to give them that psych, offer them that psychosocial support and how to deal with death because that is something I think that many of our team members um, um, are, are used to dealing with death and dying. So that's a perspective they can bring uh, to those who are perhaps seeing death uh, for the first time on, on a larger scale than they ever imagined. And uh, so I think that's where we as a palliative care 
uh, you know, so, uh, physicians and uh, uh, nurses and counselors can really play a role. So uh, uh, to sum up, these are difficult times, but uh, I I'm sure that we will come out through them. Um, we'll find our solutions uh, ourselves, and uh, and it's it's helpful really to listen to other people and to know that you're not alone. That this, these are challenges that are being faced worldwide, and we're all together in this. I I, I think that's something that we uh, yeah, that is should bring comfort to us. And so thank you, um, Stephen, and all of you for giving me this opportunity to just place this perspective in front of you. Well, thank you very much, Ramallah. I really uh, appreciate your wisdom and um, wise words. Uh, and I agree with you. I think, you know, in the silver, the only silver lining, and these are difficult times, but the only silver lining is it's just really been um, showing the importance of how to care in, in healthcare systems and, and the uh, lack of, uh, uh, you know, co capacity for the healthcare system to, to care for the kind of needs that we're used to caring for. Um, thank you again, uh, all, all the presenters, for excellent presentations today. Um, we now have a half hour to do questions and answers, um, which is sometimes the best part of these sort of webinars. And we have uh, our team standing by with questions that are being sort of, we're looking for common uh, questions um, that can be, um, you know, we answered, you know, multiple questions, but sometimes with one in one way. So. Um, Kate, um, over to you to help us uh, put forward the questions for the panel. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and thank you very much to all the panelists for these really interesting presentations. Um, the first question um, is for uh, Lucas and the participant asks, can you comment on where we are in terms of evidence on breathlessness and fentanyl patches? Um, the participants said they understand that the patches are not recommended now with COVID-19, but in general, do we have proof of its efficacy? Is it as efficient as morphine? So, so one of the issues with symptom control in COVID is that actually the evidence will just be generated. So there's only very, very little literature out there yet on, on the symptomatology and symptom treatment and COVID as such. For breathlessness and other palliative care patients such as cancer or lung disease, uh, we do know that all opioids work. So transdermal fentanyl works as well. And there are by now recommendations that also include fentanyl. So um, you can do, if, if you got it available, then you can use it. And um, the inclusion of transdermal fentanyl as a sort of a first step in the ESMO guideline clearly shows that there is enough evidence around to, to pursue such a recommendation. Um, there are other reasons why in the more global setting we would not recommend transdermal fentanyl because mostly it's much more expensive and much less available than, for example, oral morphine. So, so there are more strategic and political reasons to advocate against the transdermal fentanyl. Um, but apart from that, the evidence base definitely would say that you could use that for treatment of breathlessness as well. Thank you very much. Um, and then we have another question for you from uh, Malawi um, asking, do you have any suggestions on the management of COVID-19 related dyspnea, especially in such resource limited areas where morphine is very scarce? Yeah, that's, I read that one and I, I was a bit desperate about that as well because <laughs> yeah, to be very honest, without opioids, um, adequate relief of breathlessness is really very, very difficult. So. If you think about non-scheduled opioids such as tramadol, which I'm not sure whether that's available in Indonesia, um, then, then they definitely are not that good. They, they, you can try that, but especially for the tramadol, the non-opioid um, effective, effectiveness is, does play some role. So the opioid potential is really not as good as any of the morphine-like opioids. So if possible at all, I would recommend that really pressure is put up to the governments to get morphine into the country, uh, use the INCB um, mechanisms for rapid import mechanisms, um, if possible at all. Um, the only alternative would be to use sedatives, um, which is not really a good substitute. You basically would have to sedate the patient, well, rather deeply, and 
you would not be sure whether they still would not suffer from some degree of suffering from breathlessness. Um, you might use benzodiazepines or neuroleptics. Neuroleptics are even worse than benzos. Um, so, so this is really a worst case alternative and um, without opioids treatment of breathlessness will be really difficult. So, so this is really um, a, a really very big argument um, that these patients really, for these patients, you need to have opioids in the country. Thank you very much. Um, we've just had a, a question come in um, also addressing uh, medication. So I'll just uh, put that to you now. Um, it's the participants asking how much uh, government support in different, different countries has there been for temporary changes to repurposing of uh, medications to avoid wastage and to speed up access at a local level? Well, I, I think, well, I don't know about much government support for that. Thanks, Elora, for that question. But um, the problem is that I think that is an issue of the developed countries more than the developing countries. So, so there you would have opioids in the country used for other purposes. <laughs> Actually, one of the, the best arguments I've heard is was saying that in the US, um, the medication set aside for the death sentence should be repurposed for the COVID patients, which um, I found peculiar interesting, but probably not something that could be transferred to other countries. But most of the developing countries, the issue is that there is so little available and that these little amounts of opioids probably will be used up in intensive care rapidly. So, so the issue is not really repurposing, but really importing. And there may be problems with that as well, because right now we know that some of the main distributors um, are situated in countries that have put barriers on exporting opioids, such as the UK and Italy. So there may be even problems with getting opioids rapidly, even though the INCB does offer mechanisms for doing that. Thank you very much, Lucas. Um, the next question is for Carla, um, and just asking, can you um, expand on prevention and protective issues which are important for caregivers who are caring for people with COVID-19 at home? Oh, you need to unmute. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Um, well, I think uh, this is always a difficult issue. It's really, you have to think about the distance, physical distance that you are from the patient uh, and try to, especially if that person's coughing or has any, um, uh, or sneezing, where droplets are coming out and they're being aerosolized that's when it's a higher risk of spreading the virus. So if you can avoid that, and sometimes that might mean um, having some protective barrier around the patient and not just around yourself. Um, the, you know, it's really those droplets that you're trying to avoid. And uh, again, good hand washing is the best thing that we have. And uh, I think um, it's frightening, but we know more and more about the virus. And I think the most important thing is to try to reassure people that if they take precautions, they're not likely to get infected. I mean, there are many families who are caring for people at home who are not getting infected by that person. So it doesn't naturally happen that everyone will become infected. So just the following the very simple things of staying a distance as much as possible and then protecting yourself, most importantly, not putting your fingers in your eyes or in your nose or in your mouth after you've taken care of somebody before you wash your hands. Um, the next question is from um, Indonesia. I'm saying um, in Indonesia, when someone has passed away um, due to COVID, and there are restrictions around um, how the family can come to see the patient before he or she is buried. Um, with the evidence on um, the virus uh, not remaining longer than three hours outside, um, do we need to be this strict? Uh, 
from to not to visit. You mean to, to not visit? I didn't quite understand. To not. Um, um, so the question is um, around restrictions around the family coming to see their loved one who has passed away before mm -hmm. um, that person is buried. Um, and the question was, um, if the virus will not remain longer than three hours outside, do we still need to be this strict? Mm. That's a good question. I, I believe it probably it, much of the answer to that question has to do with your own local authorities because different um, places interpret um, how to deal with that situation um, differently. Um, I think um, that in my mind, it's always important for the family to be able to see that person and be with that person, and that's the most important part. Uh, and again, as long as people are protecting themselves, the, the real problem is that if that person's been on strict isolation where people have had to wear uh, extra protective clothing in the N95s, then that whole area is likely to be infected. If they're in a more open space, then that's not as much of a threat in terms of being exposed to the virus. But, it's, but again, remember, it's the aerosolized virus that really is more likely to go right into your nose or your eyes. And so that's the thing that you want to try to avoid. I hope that is a helpful answer. Somebody else should contribute. Can I, can I maybe add that it, I think it's not so much the uh, contagion from the deceased that people are afraid of, but rather that you have a large gather, gathering of people, some of whom may also be infected. So, so reducing the number of people at the burial site, in mm -hmm. Germany at least, is done in order to avoid larger gatherings of people. Um, as I said, some of them probably being in close contact with the deceased. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, the next question um, could be answered by, uh, I'll open up to the whole panel. Um, the participant says managing symptoms uh, for the elderly is often very challenging and would appreciate any um, recommendation on how to manage um, COVID symptoms in elderly people. So maybe I can get started. Um, I think the for the elderly people with COVID as well as in any other palliative care setting, um, you usually would start slow and start low. Um, so you would be very careful with the dosages of any medications that you would apply. But as I said, for breathlessness at least, but also for some of the other indications, you would use lower dosages than, for example, as in, in cancer patients with pain anyhow. So you might be even more careful with elderly patients, but, but you already are on the careful side with that. And you shouldn't also be too slow because the, uh, the onset of the disease in patients with severe COVID-19 may be very rapid, may be very dramatic, and you, quite often you have only a few days to treat them adequately. So the recent publication from Lowell et al. in the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management said that the average duration of treatment was three days. So you don't have much time and you probably want to have rapid uh, symptom relief and you don't want to be too careful with your dosages. Um, as for the social distancing or the, the physical distancing, I agree that I don't like the, the term social distancing. Um, for the physical distancing, I think the old people are even more impaired by that because um, we know that there are some regulations in nursing home at least where they uh, categorically forbid any close contact, any physical contact, uh, and where the elderly then are um, at a high risk of um, confusion, of um, deterioration, because they don't have the social interactions anymore. They, they don't find it easy to use um, phone conferences or use tablets for virtual communication. Um, so they are even more impaired than younger people. Um, so for them, I think we have to be uh, a little bit innovative. So if, if it's not possible to phone them in, why not use letters, use pictures, have somebody hand that to them. Um, so, so you really got to think about how to keep social contact while physically distant. Physical distance, not emotional. 
Um, we also are working on a briefing paper on um, the care of the uh, of, uh, older people that is not ready yet for uh, publication, but it'll be um, pretty soon um, available. Any other comments on that question on um, care for elders or for older people? A few of us are considered older people, I think. All right, Kate. Um, the next question is, um, what is the role of palliative care for the families of um, COVID-19 patients and for those in quarantine? Um, and another uh, follow-up question is, how can care providers supply the warmth required in palliative care at a healthy distance? Um, so I think that means the kind of emotional warmth and support. Well, let me start again. For the for the emotional side, we, we don't have that much experience with patients with COVID-19, but, but we do have some. And what I really found most difficult is not being able to embrace somebody or touch him. Um, and I didn't notice how important that is until we had the first patients where we could not do that. So so I'm, I'm personally, I find that very challenging how to do that. Uh, even without, you know, with a mask on, with a, even if you don't have the uh, FFP3, um, but just the normal mask, then you can't really see the emotions. Um, talking to people without touching them, without seeing their emotions is pretty difficult. And I haven't found a good way out of that yet. So one thing is that we just have to spend more time, that we have to be very clear that this is the, the pandemic setting that makes us wear a mask, for example, that we're... We, we discussed in our teams repeatedly whether we should remove masks when we're at an adequate distance. We said, no, we have to be an example on, on the physical distancing guidelines. Um, and patients may feel insecure when we remove our mask. Um, but, but we're still struggling with that. And I don't think anybody has got a good way forward with that. So, so that's an issue. It's even more pro problematic when you have the full PPE equipment on you because then you really can't see anything of the person. And we got some, I mean, I've seen some news where people, with, with staff members really had a picture of them on, on top of their PPE so that the, the patients and the, uh, the family at least could see what, what kind of person is inside that PPE equipment. So, so this is one of the huge challenges where we have to really think hard and try to find some way forward. I think it's, it's the situation is forcing us. Sorry, Carl, uh, just one second. Uh, is forcing us to um, make more use of virtual care, uh, telemedicine, and and doing it in a way that is not uh, you know robotic, if you will, uh, but where we can and, and there there is the um, opportunity. At least you don't have to wear a mask if you're talking to someone on a tablet. Uh, it, it doesn't transmit through the digital wires and such. Uh, but I think we're going to have to do more of this in the future. Uh, you know and it is difficult if you know, in low and middle income countries where we may not have uh, the equipment or the bandwidth or cell signal to, to do that sort of work. But all on the, the hospice I'm working with, we're in, in Washington, D.C. area. We um, are having all, all, virtually all the social work visits are being done uh, remotely on chaplaincy visits. And it's, we're sort of forced into that. Um, I don't think it's ideal, uh, but I think there's a lot that we can do with it and we can learn more about how to be more effective in, um, you know, doing counseling, doing, you know, support for families and patients. Virtually. Carla, want to come in? I just wanted to comment that Dr. Stephen Porges is a, a physiologist who's written a lot about um, the, um, the role of the vagus nerve in um, transmitting um, emotional responses back and forth. Uh, and he has a number of videos and talks about how to um, even make your eyes dilate in order to show that you're appreciative of the person in front of you and to adjust your, um, sorry about that, to adjust your tone of voice and the softness of the voice. And he said the easiest way to do it is to pretend like you're talking to a baby because that makes you smile. Everybody <laughs> smile. 
<laughs> and that helps you relax and you breathe out and then you're able to come across to that person. And people can feel that even with a mask. Thank you both. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, I'd just like to um, invite Harmala to comment on this comment on this uh, question um, from the perspective of somebody um, who would be receiving a palliative care, um, who, who would be, you know, accessing this palliative care. Um, what would make um, a person accessing palliative care feel a connection from their healthcare provider? I think that um, what's been mentioned is important. We, the tone of our voice, the, we communicate with our entire body, not just necessarily with the face. The way we hold ourselves, everything about us can show we care for this person. And um, I think just our sheer physical presence, just being there, often that's what is so comforting to people, just to know that there's someone there. They're not alone. They haven't been abandoned, even if the family cannot be with them. I think that's important. Uh, I know that uh, I've, I've heard that uh, care, care providers have often been connecting the person who they're looking after with the family by using a phone or a video or something or the other, trying to keep that connection going and alive. And I think that's another wonderful way of doing it. Um, I think all of us respond to music. We have our favorite piece of music that speaks to us. And perhaps just finding out what this person loves and playing that piece of music for them, I think, could also bring comfort. Um, maybe um, a, 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 even a picture, a photograph, something the other that they treasure. Uh, just to maintain that human connection. I think that's what's important. And um, I, I think that uh, even if we are dressed like aliens, as it were, uh, we can still do this. Um, it's been beautifully said by Dr. Carla Alexander, how, you know, even your voice, your eyes, everything speaks, uh, speaks for you. And um, And I really think that the love we feel for each other is something that really doesn't need words to communicate. If you're there with the depth of your heart and your love, you know, the distance doesn't make any difference. It doesn't matter what you weigh. We are communicating. So let's never underestimate that. Presence. Thank you very much. Um, time for one more question. Thank you. Um, there's a question just come in uh, for, for Dr. Dingle. There are reports of hospitals and clinics with empty beds because patients with conditions other than COVID are afraid of accessing care. Have you seen a decrease in the number of palliative care consultations in people with cancer in your center? So thank you for that question. Interestingly, um, no, is the answer. In fact, we are running into problems with bed space um, in our little cancer unit because of what I was speaking about before, that we're actually seeing a, a lot more very sick people who need acute interventions um, and we're prioritizing those folks. So the, the people who don't really need to come are not coming. But I guess I'm not quite sure why people are coming out of the woodwork with, with severe pain, you know, shortness of breath, ascites, all the things that I mentioned in my talk. And so we're actually seeing the opposite. We're seeing cancer patients accessing care um, with more determination, I suppose, because there's a feeling that if, if I don't come now, I might not be able to come or there's going to be a total lockdown or perhaps people are now much more aware of their mortality because they could die of something else. So they're now rushing to seek care for their cancer, whereas before they may have um, just sort of sat at home and watched it, they're now coming forward to be cared for. So we're actually seeing the opposite, no empty beds here. 
yeah, we're getting mix, mixed reports from different parts of the world about um, about that. Um, people are obviously also afraid to come to hospitals um, for fear of being infected. Uh, we're down to the last few minutes, and we have a few things um, to share with you before we close the webinar for this week. Um, um, we're going to, uh, as I said earlier, we're having these, this is a series of webinars. The next webinar that we're going to be having is going to be uh, on caring for children with underlying serious health conditions during this. Uh, and I've, I've asked um, um, Professor Julia Downing, who's uh, head of the International Children's Palliative Care Network, just to say a few words about the plans for next week. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. So we're looking forward to our webinar next week. Um, we have four of the briefing notes that are, have been developed around children, and we're going to be discussing those. So we're going to be looking at caring for children with underlying serious health conditions during the COVID pandemic pandemic, symptom life at the end of life in children with COVID, and then importantly, the psychological, spiritual and social impact of COVID-19 um, on children with palliative care needs. So a, a mixture of topics, um, and uh, we're excited. We're just confirming the speakers, um, but please do join us next Friday uh, to look at some of these issues around children. Thank you. Thank you. We're looking at look for the announcement with the details on that, on how to register and all. Um, we have something just a slightly off topic, but a rather critical uh, issue of advocacy for palliative care. And um, for just a minute, I'd like uh, Catherine Pettis from IHBC to mention about the resolution from the European Union. Catherine, are you with us? I am. Hi, everybody. I'm going to share my screen because. Um, this shows our advocacy page on the IHPC website. There is going to be a virtual session of the World Health Organization, um, World yeah. Health Assembly on May 18th. Usually it's a week long meeting and civil society gets to participate. This year, not the case. Um, and the European Union has proposed a draft resolution on the national COVID-19 responses, which is going to be discussed on that day. That's the only thing that's going to be discussed as far as we know. The, the very limited modalities have come out already. And the zero draft of that resolution did not mention palliative care. So WHPCA, Claire Morris and I have done a lot of work together to get some letters that we would like you to please send to your mission or to your ambassador or to your health ministry to please request the inclusion of the language that we've drafted um, to include palliative care in both the preambular paragraphs of the resolution as well as the operational paragraphs. And if you go to our website, all the instructions, all the dots are joined up here. Shouldn't take more than 20 minutes to get these letters out. Um, so we please ask you to do that. We've got one country which is already, as far as we know, behind us, and that's Australia, which is great. But Australia is going to need some support to negotiate on this resolution. So thanks for giving me the floor for a minute, Stephen. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Let's get rid of your screen share. Stephen, just whilst you're doing that, just to say Claire is also included in the chat. Um, how to access those documents as well. Claire, do you have any comment? I think she's with her child at the moment, so. I apologize, you can probably hear my daughter in the background. Um, no, I've got no comments. Um, the link I sent uh, is the same link, to, uh, but slightly different link, but the uh, information on the language is the same, so any help you can provide would be fantastic because it's such an important opportunity to get palliative care into the COVID-19 response language. Okay well on that note um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, we have as we've said uh, seven more webinars planned uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, please join me in thanking our faculty today um, Dr. Radbrack, Dr. Carl Alexander and Dr. Dingle Spence and Harmala Gupta. Uh, on behalf of the Global Palliative Care Organizations, this is Stephen Connor signing off and hoping 
you stay well, do good work, and keep in touch. Thanks again. Thanks, Steve. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. everyone.